from the idyllic and otherwise quiet Caribbean island of Antigua and from this unique piece of industrial real estate that spills from northern Vermont over the border into Canada via a ship that is not what it appears to be come shipments of deadly weapons arms for South Africa and there is, it appears, an American connection. Good evening, I'm Christopher Leiden. The story we're about to tell is a remarkable one, one you were never meant to hear. It is about the way South Africa has been able to obtain armaments from an American defense contractor. This, despite a United States arms embargo since 1964, and the United Nations embargo since 1977. The shipments plainly violate both embargoes. They involve, in one way or another, the governments of the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. This program has been in production since early this year. The pursuit of the story has taken the producer, William Cran, to three continents and the Caribbean Sea, together with reporters David Taylor of the British Broadcasting Corporation and Eric Malling of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, who starts the story with this ship. Its cargoes are the source of our suspicion, its voyages the thread of our story. The name of the ship is the S.A. Tugela Land, a sleek modern general cargo vessel of some 10,000 tons. We first learned about the Tugela Land in a letter from Africa. Inside it, we found an anonymous handwritten note. We finally found the man who'd sent the letter in Botswana, a small black African state just north of South Africa. Chris Wood lives in exile here because he's a white South African who's actively opposed to his own country's racist policies and government. Wood was once a sergeant in South Africa's crack parachute regiment. Now, through a network of undercover contacts, he collects information the South African authorities would rather keep secret. Through one of these anonymous informants, he'd come to hear about the Tugela land. The information I received was that a ship called the S.A. Tugela Land had unloaded arms and ammunition at Cape Town Harbor en route from New York via Antigua. These arms were field cannon, two radar trucks. It was that heavy artillery equipment which we suspected might have come from Canada. Wood didn't know who shipped it, but he certainly knew who picked it up. From the South African side, I think it was definitely a government operation in that there were two security police, um, South African security police on board the ship. One was a major and one was a lieutenant. And they appear to have been there for supervising the whole operation. One of the most amazing military stories of the last two decades has been how South Africa transformed a small army with Second World War weapons into the most powerful on the African continent. With all its armor and the latest deadly technology, it's now one of the world's ten most potent strike forces. But the world arms embargo makes it difficult to get spare parts and supplies. In recent years, there's been a particular shortage of heavy artillery ammunition. John Stockwell once worked for the American Central Intelligence Agency in Africa. He told us that the CIA actually wanted to supply South Africa with the 155 millimeter shells it needed. At one time, we wanted to send 155 ammunition to South Africa. They had requested it, and we wanted to, to honor the request. We also wanted to send some additional arms to our allies inside Angola. The, the concept was to send a ship with ammunition to Windhoek, Southwest Africa and the South Africans would distribute this ammunition and material into Angola. The 155 ammunition would have been for their own 155 tubes, which were not in Angola, they were in South Africa. And uh, we, we were stopped from, from doing this by uh, Ambassador Mulcahy of the State Department. The CIA never carried out that plan, a plan which would have been illegal in the U.S. But did the agency drop the idea altogether? or did it look for an alternative route? We were frustrated in that plan, and we did not develop another plan to deliver ammunition or material to South Africa. However, the, the CIA didn't change its stance of being willing to cooperate with South Africa. We just weren't permitted to do it then. 
Another thing that did not change was the South African Army's quite desperate demand for those cannon shells. They fired so many of them during their foray into Angola that there was now a real shortage. South Africa's new prime minister was then the Minister of Defense. Peter Botha isn't named Peter the Weapon for nothing, and he was determined that his army would get what it needed, regardless of the weapons blacklist against it. The first suspicion that South Africa might be getting its shells from Canada came at an Ottawa press conference given by the black nationalist leader Joshua Nkomo. And Como claimed that a large quantity of arms had been shipped from a Canadian port to Cape Town in South Africa. 900 tons. According to Nkomo, the Canadian port was St. John, New Brunswick. But he did not know what Canadian company might be involved, or indeed what the Canadian government knew about it. The government of Canada, of course, should be interested in trying to discover and to stop it. And Como did have another clue. He had a name. And a ship, I'll tell you the name of the ship. The ship is the Tugela. To find out more about this ship, we went to Hamburg. The Tugela land is owned by a Hamburg company. She's registered here and flies the German flag. But the Tugela land is more than she appears to be. There's even a clue in her name. The Tugela is a river in South Africa, which made us wonder if there was any connection between South Africa and the ship's owners. We found them in a drab office building in the center of Hamburg. Here we learned that the German company, Globus Reederei, is in fact controlled by SAF Marine, or to give it its full title, South African Marine. Globus Reederei had come to an arrangement in which it leased the Tugela land back to South African Marine, its own parent company in Cape Town, South Africa. The result of this complicated and confusing arrangement is that the records of containers and cargo carried by the Tugela land are kept safe in South Africa. So in reality, the Tugela land is controlled by South African Marine, a company in which the South African government itself has a substantial holding. That's significant because this ship, named by Nkomo, had indeed carried artillery shells for a Canadian manufacturer. After Nkomo's charges, local television, radio, and newspapers reported that these shells had been made and shipped by a company calling itself the Space Research Corporation of Highwater, Quebec. But space research assured everyone that it had never shipped shells nor any kind of weapon to southern Africa. This report from Frank Roach in Montreal. SRC does manufacture 155 millimeter shells at the Highwater Complex but they are for ballistic testing in other countries as well as in Canada and the United States, and the shells are shipped empty. They are simply casings which will be fitted later with primers and warheads by the customers. They could not be sold to South Africa and Rhodesia because both countries are on an international arms blacklist. According to the company, the shells they make are either fired at their own test range in Quebec or shipped to the Caribbean island of Antigua where they have another warmer, long-range test site. The company's president, Dr. Gerald Bull, denied the charges over and over again, and eventually, the story seemed forgotten. Uh, the allegations have uh, been investigated and refuted, uh, absolutely, uh, uh, and in a strong manner, by the government of Antigua. Uh, the Canadian government has uh, investigated the claim and said there's no claim and there's no sub substance to it and we've denied it every time it has arisen. Space Research Corporation is an intriguing company not only because of the work it does. Some confusion exists as to whether it is a Canadian company, an American company, or a Canadian-American company. From documents that the company has on file with the Office of Munitions Control in Washington, we have determined that Space Research is an American company. Its Canadian and other overseas operations, like the one in Antigua, are apparently subsidiaries of Space Research Corporation, which is incorporated in Delaware with head offices in North Troy, Vermont. More than that, as we will establish later in this story, Space Research has had a special relationship with the United States Department of Defense, the Pentagon. But for the moment, we're concerned with its subsidiary company on the Caribbean island of Antigua, a British protectorate, where BBC reporter David Taylor continues the story.
scalloped with blue and green bays and rimmed by golden beaches, Antigua is about the last place in the world where you'd look for arms smuggling. It's what the travel brochures call a tropical paradise, a favorite playground for tourists and lovers, besporting themselves in its sapphire water. Yet tucked away on this seemingly carefree island is a place where neither tourists nor lovers are welcome, a place well away from Antigua's conventional beauty spots. To get there, you have to drive inland across the island to where Antigua's poverty is all too apparent. The road is seldom used. Antiguans say it's because of the jumbies. Jumbies are the ghosts of the departed who walk backwards during a full moon. There is, of course, a simpler reason, namely that Crab's Point is a prohibited area. Little is known about Crab's Point except that it's owned by a mysterious company calling itself the Space Research Corporation. What it's doing here is shrouded in secrecy. The peninsula is protected by well-drilled soldiers who frighten people away. But even they can't hide the sounds that come from Crab's Point. If anyone knows what's going on here, it ought to be the British governor, who is responsible for the island's defense and foreign affairs. But the British presence in Antigua is a discreet one. They'll do nothing to embarrass the Antiguan government. So they keep their lips buttoned and their uniforms pressed. Even so, on a small Caribbean island, the rumors are bound to multiply and be set to music. Somebody joking. <laughs> The joke, such as it is, is on the people of Antigua. The Antiguans feel that their island is being turned into a military base. They're joking, they're joking. The government has banned this calypso about space research and made a celebrity out of the songwriter, the mighty Scorpion. The US have this new bomb. Somebody joking to kill people thousand miles around is joke they're making now is one thing i fear they're joking they're joking suppose they want to test it right here they have to be joking whoever may be laughing in antigua it's certainly not these soldiers they're in deadly earnest the antigua defense force is like no other army in the world it's being trained and paid for by a private corporation, Space Research. When we approached the soldiers, they were less than friendly. We snatched these shots through the back window of a car, but when a sergeant grew suspicious, filming had to stop. To get a better idea of what's going on at Crab's Point, we hired a small boat. No one pays much attention to the local fishermen, and we thought we'd be all right. The peninsula is a fly-blown, desolate-looking place, overgrown by scrub. But every now and again, we saw obvious signs of space researchers' activity. Crab's Point is heavily instrumented with tracking and surveillance radars, with telemetry receiving stations, and willowy antennae that reach into the sky. Then, of course, there's the ever-present soldiery, who, according to the Antiguan government, are being schooled in high-speed photography. Finally, as we rounded the peninsula, we caught a glimpse of some radar huts and a khaki-colored cannon. Fishermen have been told to keep clear of waters which are within shooting range of Crab's Point. Obviously, some kind of long-range shell was being tested here. But what kind of shell? And how was it getting to the island? The answers were to be found in Antigua's capital, St. John's. Early in 1977, an American-Canadian corporation called Space Research began to ship equipment into the port. Most of the cargo came in containers, which were handled with particular care. 
As well as the regular security guards, two platoons of the Antigua Defense Force kept watch over the containers. The containers that the Antigua Defense Force guards on the docks in Antigua are among the key elements of our search. In this film, we will trace three separate shipments of containers, the bulk of which contain 155 millimeter shell casings, short only of their primers and warheads. The first two shipments go via Antigua. For a description of the first, we return to Eric Malling in New Brunswick, Canada. In order to supply its new Antigua facility, Space Research shipped material through the nearest Canadian ocean port, St. John, New Brunswick. It's perfectly normal for Space Research Corporation to be sending shells and equipment down to Antigua for testing. There's no problem with that. At issue, though, is whether all that material stayed in Antigua or whether at least some of it went on to southern Africa. Early last year, Space Research assembled 36 containers on the dock in St. John, New Brunswick. A ship called the Mura picked up 20 of the containers and shipping papers said they were filled with 155 millimeter steel forgings. The Mura left St. John, New Brunswick and headed for St. John's, Antigua. Then a second ship, Lindiger Coral, picked up the other 16 containers full of steel forgings and a meteorological van. All of this was consigned to space research in Antigua. Both ships unloaded their containers full of steel forgings, in plain English, shell casings, at the port in St. John's, Antigua. The 36 containers full of these shell casings were on the dock, but what happened to them next caused a fierce dispute on the island. Two weeks after the last of the 36 containers was unloaded in Antigua, the S.A. Tugela land comes steaming back into the story on its way from New York to Cape Town, South Africa, via the tiny island of Antigua. The Tugela land picked up the 36 containers when it stopped in Antigua, but there are two stories about what was in them. Space research said they were empty, and the shells all stayed on the island. But the records kept by the port director in St. John's, Antigua, Emil Sweeney, show something different. Sweeney wrote a confidential report to his minister which detailed the Tugela land's business on its stops in Antigua. We obtained that letter, and Sweeney later confirmed that in it he had said the containers which went aboard the Tugela land were indeed full of space research shells. Space research put its case through John Kieran, a Toronto public relations man who's also listed as a vice president of Bull's company. Well, I'm not familiar with the port director's uh, letters or his uh, remarks, but uh, I certainly know that uh, the steel forgings that we sent to Antigua were either consumed in Antigua or are still in Antigua, and that covers 100% of those forgings. But the port director should surely know. I mean, he's very clear. The SS Tugela land loaded 36 containers with rough steel forgings. Uh, this is the man who runs the port, and he's, he's writing to his own minister of finance. He'd be pretty careful about that. I'm not so sure that he would be that careful. Uh, for example, I can probably show you more forged port documents coming out of Antigua than, uh, than you've already got, and I'm sure you've got a bunch of them. But I remember, for example... Why would the, why would the port director forge a document? about what is being loaded onto a ship. Well, I think sport. you have to remember that there is a violent controversy within the radical left through the Caribbean. Emil Sweeney, the port director, is not part of the radical left in Antigua. I'm not uh, going to make any opinion as to what his uh, involvement is. I only know that there has been an enormous quantity of forged documents concerning movements in and out of that port. Well, Mr. But Sweeney it, acknowledges I, this letter, 36... 36 containers of steel forgings. This cargo was shipped by Space Research Corporation. That could it, very easily be, Eric. It went, on also the SA, it, it went on the Tugela land, and you know where the Tugela land went next, South Africa. That, uh, you're trying to make an allegation, and that's dirty pool. Now, I can also show you documents that have come out of Mr. Sweeney's office showing the shipment of radar vans, for example, that are supposedly out on the Tagala land coming back on a roundabout way to Canada, and they're still in Antigua. So don't pin uh, your, uh, your allegation on the fact that somebody has said that these containers were filled, because I think you'll find, if you begin examining port documents coming out of Antigua, 
that there is an extraordinary reluctance to be precise as to whether containers are in fact filled or empty. Mr. Sweeney, the port director, is being very precise. They were full. There were 36, and they were full of steel forgings. It was his job to check them. Well, and I can assure you and state categorically that Mr. Sweeney did not do his job. But another set of documents confirming the port directors are here. Vernon Edwards was the shipping agent who handled the Tagala Lands cargo for space research. Uh, in manifest for mid August, Bob. Edwards was in England when we were in Antigua, but his son showed us the record on the Tagala Lands pickup. The first 20 containers loaded were full of steel forgings. There were two gun assemblies, then another 16 containers of steel forgings, radar van, and other equipment. Mr. Edwards filled out the customs declarations. 36 containers filled with steel forgings. Your agent in Antigua. I can assure you that Space Research has not shipped any steel forgings out of Antigua, with the exception of spent casings going to Europe for metallurgical testing. But those containers, those 30-some containers that went out in May on the South African ship were empty, in your view? They, you were, they were. Empty. Yes, they were. But your own shipping agent. No, not our own. Uh, we 36 could... containers full of steel forgings. Uh, don't, Vernon Edwards. Don't, don't use words like your own as if uh, that's an accusation. Mr. Edwards has done some work for us. And I can assure you that irrespective of what any documents he may have, have, have filled out, in error or otherwise, no steel forgings from space research have gone from Antigua to any country in the world with the exception of some spent casings for metallurgical testing. We finally traced Edwards in London, where British reporter David Taylor asked him where he got the information in his documents. Naturally from the uh, information that uh, was given to me by uh, the shippers. So space research told you um, uh, what they were going to um, ship out? Yes. And did they also tell you the point of destination? Naturally. Space research also told him that the whole cargo was bound, strangely enough, back to Canada. Have you any reason to believe that uh, the Chugela land did go to Canada as opposed to anywhere else? I have no reasons. I mean, I accepted what they told me and that is sufficient for me. These 36 containers of steel forgings, am I right in thinking that these are the containers that were delivered at Antigua by the Mora and the Lindiga Coral? Yes. So these ships came to Antigua bringing containers from Canada and then the Chugela land comes to Antigua and takes the same containers back to Canada. <laughs> Would you be surprised to learn that the Chugela land didn't go back to Canada after leaving Antigua, but went instead to South Africa? I would be surprised to learn that, just because uh, the original idea was that she was going to Canada. That's what you were told. The containers full of shells weren't all that shipping agent Vernon Edwards remembers putting on the Tugela land. There was also the general cargo, which included gun parts and two vans full of electronic equipment. Despite what Edwards was told, the ship did not go to Canada. It docked next in Cape Town, South Africa, a fact confirmed both by Lloyd's shipping intelligence and Chris Wood from the beginning of our film, who has a completely separate witness who saw it being unloaded. Apart from containers and artillery parts, two vans full of electronic equipment were seen coming off. That, then, is the first shipment. Before we detail the other two, we need to know more about Space Research Corporation about its history and its connections in the United States military establishment, and about a remarkable man, its president, Dr. Gerald Bull. Eric Malling of CBC continues. Gerald Bull has had a remarkable career. He's a brilliant scientist who had, in an earlier day, been the youngest PhD ever to graduate from the University of Toronto. Later at McGill University in Montreal, 
Bo was heading a team of scientists who literally wanted to shoot Canada into the space race. He created a group called the High Altitude Research Project, HARP for short, and it got a lot of attention in Canada. In 1963, a U.S. Navy landing craft beached on Barbados and Gerald Bull's main research tool trundled off. It was a giant gun with a barrel 16 inches across. But Bull's real breakthrough was actually the shells. These could do what Jules Verne had once fantasized, literally be shot clean out of the Earth's atmosphere and into space. While the Americans spent billions putting up rockets, Bull was going to shoot Canadian probes into space at a fraction the cost. Dr. Bull, you've been working for this day for two years. How do you feel now? Well, we feel pretty good after that shot. It uh, looks like we had a fully successful launching. Uh, the gun's in excellent condition. Where do you go from here? Well, on this particular series, is it really an engineering series? Uh, we have the Marla twos to go. We have four of them standing by here that will be launching this, uh, this week. And they, they'll get us right up to the... Uh, uh, 150 to 200 kilometer band. That is uh, roughly, say, six, seven hundred thousand feet. The McGill scientists wanted to use the project to research weather, communications, and so forth. But the U.S. Army was paying half the bill, and its interest was in the big gun. The ultimate application of his work was a ticklish subject for Dr. Bull. Well, that that is a that's rather a tough question. Uh, we. Um, we felt that the uh, Americans would be more interested in the technique because of the, their very diversified program and, and uh, their known diversified approach to all problems. General Clark was the Pentagon's representative at the project. It was commissioned for peaceful research, but all of the Army's research is necessarily headed toward the things the Army is interested in. The, uh, we, we must always be prepared to take our part of the national defense. This is information which we think will be valuable to us. But high altitude research was too expensive and indeed becoming too military for McGill and the Canadian government's research budget. So to keep things going, Bull had to go to the Pentagon for more and more of his money. The High Altitude Research Project at McGill was finished, but Bull's people stayed with him in a new private company, Space Research Corporation. Bull was to become president and chief scientist in the new firm, which by now was incorporated in both Canada and the United States, but depending on American military money to finance the work on its big shells. Soon, Bull was claiming that he could shoot a 100-pound payload into space. Meanwhile, bold scientists at Space Research dreamed of even bigger cannons, ones that might ultimately replace rocket missiles and still deliver the same deadly payload. The full potential of Space Research's work may be a mystery to Canadians, but not here at the NASA Library in Washington. Plug Space Research into the computer, and up comes, among other things, terminal ballistics and even nuclear weapons. Someone who's done research for the Pentagon into futuristic weapons is Ed Citrone. From his work as a weapons analyst, he knew about the ultimate military uses of Bull's research. You're most likely putting up some sort of terminal uh, guide and guided bomb. You're putting it up there, you're going to let it orbit, you know, either a long time or a short time, and then bring it down again at a designated target. It's going to be a bomb sitting there in orbit, waiting to be brought down, basically. Citrone believed that the foundation for this top-secret orbiting bomb came from Bull's early work at McGill's High Altitude Research Project. In 1967, uh, open literature discussion of it, let's put it that way, sort of disappeared. In a sense, it sort of went underground. Um, in my opinion, this probably means the military said, hey, wait a minute, this is no longer just some theory that we're testing out. Um, it can be done. Um, it will be effective. Uh, let's not keep telling people about it. Let's get it under wraps and keep developing it. 
tucked away in the Quebec hills south of Montreal, Space Research Corporation has a unique 10,000-acre site straddling the Canadian-American border. Gerald Bull's huge family home peeks out over tiny high water and closer in, his own hidden valley. Right at Bull's doorstep, but far from any public road, are space researchers' machine shops, radar tracking stations, caches of explosives, telemetry and high-speed photographic departments. They're linked by Bull's own road to the test ranges for space researchers' various projectiles, including the ones fired from this 172-foot-long 16-inch gun. In the middle of it all, here at the cut in the trees, space researchers' own private road crosses the border. On the American side, space research does sophisticated electronic work on, among other things, guidance systems for shells and missiles. And over on the Canadian side, it tests and actually manufactures the guns and shells. Space research employees here even have their own special plates. However, that bit of advertising is quite out of character for this most confidential corporation. The focus of their work has changed a good deal from the old futuristic research that was done in the McGill days. Now, yes? Hi. Well, you're employees of the plant, I presume? Pardon me? I say, are you employees of the No, I'm not an employee of the plant. We're from the CBC. It's not easy to be unobtrusive at this gate, and our camera obviously made the security man nervous. Yeah, they're pretty, pretty sticky about cameras in here. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, well, is that, is it scientific stuff? Space research spokesman had claimed the company couldn't possibly have sold shells to South Africa or anyone else, because until recently, it made only what it needed for its own testing. But when the security guard called the site manager, he contradicted the official statement and told me that space research had for years been manufacturing shells for sale. Have you done any production before this? Uh, we, do, we do production since, uh, was it three years now? Seven or two, they built production shop. Okay, for uh, shells. But you've been making the 155 millimeter shells since yeah. 72, yeah. eh? Yeah. Do you sell them at all or just use them for research? Oh, no, at this we sell stage? them. Oh, we do. Yeah. That's why we got production now. The only big production we should see if we call, uh, yeah. could call big is 155. Yeah. That confirmed again what I had been trying to say all along. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Shillingford. The focus of their work has changed from the futuristic research they did for McGill. They're into something a good deal more traditional, field artillery. But it's artillery with a difference. Gerald Bull has been heard to boast that given enough time, he could lob a shell from here to Mexico City. So with that kind of confidence, the firm set out to get permits to export armaments and now, with a lot of financing help from the Canadian federal government, it's all set to start full-scale production of a new 155-millimeter howitzer. The basic design of cannons like these has hardly changed since the Second World War. With all the attention on missiles, rockets, and jet planes, conventional cannons have been ignored by most of the generals. Throughout the world, some 19,000 of these kind of guns are becoming obsolete. Gerald Bull's Space Research Corporation is now marketing a kit that can make new guns from old. The modifications would cost about $100,000, a third the price of an all-new gun. It's an answer to the Soviet Union and its allies, which have pressed on with better artillery. Their big guns carry farther, kill more. So in the West, manufacturers are racing to produce a new generation of howitzers and field guns. Gerald Bull has invented what may be the best of them all. The GC-45 was developed at Space Research's High Water site. There are still very few published photographs of it, even in the artillery business, because it's still so new. But Gerald Bull and Space Research have worked hardest not on the gun, but on a new super shell. They've developed a new 155 millimeter ERFB, or extended range full bore shell. Longer and thinner than the conventional one, it is perfectly shaped so it can hit targets 30 kilometers away. That's half again as far as conventional shells travel. 
NATO's high command has issued new specifications for 155 millimeter artillery ammunition. It wants a round that can be fired over 30 kilometers. The contracts to make those shells are worth millions and millions. The West German Army fires 200,000 shells a year in target practice alone. That's a contract space research hopes to get, because at $200 a shell, the bill would be $40 million a year. Gerald Bull had done the basic research for this new shell when he was working at McGill's High Altitude Research Project. By the early 1970s, his Space Research Corporation was confident it had the product, but it needed a sales network. So Space Research looked around for a partner and found one in Belgium, a country which has been making artillery for 400 years. The Canadians tied into a conglomerate of big weapons firms, which included, among others, the one which makes the famous FN rifle. This new sales subsidiary called Space Research Corporation International was incorporated in 1972 and opened up shop in an office block in Brussels. The boss's office is plain enough. Its main ornament is quite simply one of Space Research's 155 millimeter extended range full bore shells. Like most arms sellers, Louis Palaccio is camera shy, but he's proud to preach the virtues of his company's main product. Glossy brochures proclaim its advantages over old shells, one and a half times the range, two and a half times the destruction, and in every way, more bang for the buck. While the company pursued sales of its new 155 millimeter shell, it also had other, bigger ordnance in its inventory. One of these made its way to Israel. The Israelis needed to counter Arab firepower, so to even things up, the United States State Department, then under Henry Kissinger, arranged for the Israeli forces to get a shell which, fired from the Golan Heights, could hit Damascus, 40 miles away. The shells came from space research. But that's another story. We're concerned with the company's 155 millimeter shells and two more shipments that reached South Africa. David Taylor of the BBC picks up the story with a now familiar ship. In August 1977, the Land was bound for Antigua for the second time. 30 containers belonging to Space Research had been stored on the ship at St. John, New Brunswick. 10 containers were empty, but the rest held more than 10,000 shells. The Canadian shipping papers said that all 30 containers were to be taken off when the Land reached Antigua. But the Canadian shipping papers are contradicted by the records kept at the Antigua port. The port director is Emil Sweeney. According to his paperwork, the 10,000 shells that Ugela Land was carrying stayed on board. We've obtained a confidential letter written by Sweeney to a government minister, which details what the Ugela Land offloaded in Antigua. In it, he says that 10 empty containers were taken off the ship and three full ones. The full containers held jeep parts and one bag of cement. Morning, yes. Emil Sweeney's version of events is supported by space researcher's shipping agent, Vernon Edwards. Mm, she brought in some empty containers and um, I think two other containers with uh, consignment of jeep and uh, bits and pieces. According to the uh, shipping agent at uh, St. John's, New Brunswick, the Chugela land was carrying a consignment of 30 containers for Antigua. Containers which had um, more than 10,000 shells in them. I don't know anything about that. And that didn't happen. They were not unloaded at Antigua. I don't know anything about that at all. On the same visit to Antigua, the Chugela land picked up some additional cargo for space research. The dockers remember that day because there was an accident. The crane operator dropped a container into the Chugela Land's hold and the doors burst open. And the container was so heavy that the crane broke down and wanted to do fly open. And we see a lot of ammunition, different things in shells and a lot of elaborate things were in it. What kind of shells? How, how big were they? Um, good size elaborate stuff. 
Is that what you saw, Martin? Yes. This, we, we discharged them and a several ship and the same go to space research and we when the container burst open we saw the same thing that we discharged for space research in the container also with one of the gunners you, you know you but saw, we saw you one saw a gun gun yes and the same, same kind gun, of gun that, that we discharged earlier ships yes, had brought, brought to for space Charles. research yes mm. and where did the chugela land go after it left antigua the second time mm, we cleared her for Barbados. Everyone at the Antigua dock, including the port director, thought those space research shells were bound for Barbados, where space research have another test site. The doubt started when Marty White lost his front door key. I dropped my bunch of key, and after I reached home and I finally didn't have it, when I returned back to the ship, I asked the captain, the captain helped me to get it. You get your key. Get my key. Then I said, thank you, share you until I see you again. He said, no, you would not, you all would not see me again because I'm bound for South Africa. I said, well, say hello for me. When you go home to your family, say, we would not reach home just now. I said, goodbye, and that's all. I then, I came to my general secretary the following day and told him that we don't think that we should work on anything for space research again because the same cargo that we discharge for space research, we found it going out and to South Africa, the ship bound for South Africa. After its second trip to Antigua, the Chugela land went nowhere near Barbados. According to Lloyd Shipping Intelligence, it sailed southeast to Cape Town. So, as the ship set sail for South Africa, the 10,000 shells it had loaded in Canada were still in its hold. And so were the extra shells and the gun the dockers had seen. This time, however, the Tugela land was to leave a storm in its wake. The Antiguan dockers refused to handle space researchers' cargoes. Left-wing elements on the island started attacking the government in order to block charges of official complicity in arms shipments to South Africa. The Prime Minister, Mr. V.C. Byrd, commissioned a report on space research. It was co-written by his son, the Vice Premier, whose law firm Byrd & Byrd has space research as one of its clients. But the report did more harm than good. It included Vernon Edwards' customs declaration for the Dukela Land's May or first voyage, stating that space researchers' shells had gone back to Canada. We now know that they went to Cape Town, South Africa. Nonetheless, this report, together with John Kieran's interview, constituted much of space researchers' line of defense against the charges. Then, less than a week ago, the BBC's David Taylor finally got to the president himself and asked Dr. Bull about both the interview and the report. And the government told us, leave it to us. This is just local politics. Leave it to us. We will handle all this. Don't you get involved, you'll only get hurt. Which is a, sort of a fatal statement. Now, I believe that it was in September that Mr. Kieran uh, gave uh, an interview and put the SRC point of view. Why didn't he produce these documents on that occasion? After all, you, by that time, you were taking it seriously. Well, I, I would say that, that uh, John, uh, in giving his interview, uh, hadn't studied out the, the, hadn't had time to study the situation. And I don't think we had all of our evidence. When it became clear that the RCMP and, and the United States authorities were all getting uh, excited over this, uh, I said, I, I, clearly, it was a scale to say, hey, hold the fort. And I, I started a, an intensive review to find out what, uh, what went on. I just feel, Dr. Bull, that if I was unjustly accused of having shipped arms to South Africa, I would try to nip the matter in the bud. Certainly, I wouldn't wait until things had got to such a pass where I was being investigated by law enforcement officers in four different countries. That's, that's obviously true. These studies take uh, a long period of, of time. And uh, unfortunately, we can't move any faster than the police forces or anybody else. We say we didn't do it, and John Kieran certainly said that. We did not do it. Dr. Bull is emphatic that space research didn't do it.
But outside of the two shipments that went via Antigua, there is a third, bigger shipment. Here are two reports from Eric Malling in Canada and David Taylor in Barcelona, Spain. Last fall, here in St. John, New Brunswick, Space Research Corporation began to assemble its biggest shipment of shells so far. Fifty-five containers were stacked at the Brunterm Container Depot in the port. According to the export permit which Space Research obtained from the Canadian government, these shells were to be used at their test site in Antigua and were 155 millimeter extended range full bore inert projectiles. They said they wanted to ship out 35,000 shells altogether and put their value at six million dollars. Once again, a South African ship, none other than the Tagela Land, had been chosen to carry the shells to Antigua. But before the Tagela Land got to St. John, Encomo exposed it as the ship carrying arms to Southern Africa. Frightened off by the publicity, the Tagela Land canceled the pickup. What was it going to pick up for you? I have no idea. Did you have material waiting in St. John to be shipped last fall? I don't recall. I know we had some things uh, going to Spain uh, at that time, but I don't recall anything going to the Caribbean. The week after Encomo's charges and the start of RCMP inquiries, space research sought another export permit. Now the government of Spain was to receive the 155 millimeter projectiles. This time, the 35,000 shells were marked up to $7 million. Why did they go to Spain, and what were they to be used for in Spain? You'd have to ask the government of Spain. The government of Spain? Mm -hmm. Just the government of Spain you sent them to? What well, part of the no. government of Spain? No, that's, uh, you'd, if you want to ask, uh, ask questions about that shipment, I would suggest that you seek uh, information either from the government of Canada, which provided the export permit, or the government of Spain, which provided for their entry to the country. But you're the company that shipped them. I mean, surely you're the ones we should ask. What were those shells to be used for in Spain? I say, you'd, if you'd like to know, and if they would like to tell you, ask them. Why can't you tell me? For the simple reason that uh, it's not my business to tell you what a user wants these things for. And if you want information, I'd say go and ask the government of Spain. Well, you, you keep using the term government of Spain. I mean, did they go to the Spanish army? Did they go to the Spanish health department or Department of Agriculture? Where did they go in Spain? Ask the government. But whoever was getting the shells, they would have to be patient. Space research had to wait almost six months before it could ship its containers. After Encomo's charges, the Mounties wanted to be assured that none of the shells were loaded. So they opened every container and every tenth casing before clearing the shipment. On a winter night in March this year, a Danish ship, the Nordfarer, entered the harbor at St. John, New Brunswick, and tied up at the wharf of the Brunterm Container Depot. It stayed only a few hours. Dock workers remember quickly loading the 55 containers into the hold. That evening, on the same tide, Space Research's containers full of shells finally set out to sea. The ship's captain sailed east across the Atlantic, but it wasn't until he reached the Spanish coast that he received radio instructions telling him exactly where to stop. Finally, the ship was off the coast at Barcelona. According to the discharge manifest, the 55 containers were offloaded at Barcelona and consigned to a company called Barreros Hermanos. Barreros Hermanos are currently being investigated by Spanish customs because of another suspected armed shipment, which aroused the interest of both the British press and police. It too involved arms for South Africa, but that's another story. Barreros Hermanos had asked a Senior Tintore Blanc to handle space researchers 55 containers and we found his office in a palm-lined square near Barcelona's docks. We had to talk to him because he would be the best man to tell us what happened to the 55 containers of shells after they'd come off the ship at Barcelona, and he would know whether they went to the government of Spain or not. But when I went upstairs and said I was a television reporter, he refused to even see me. We hadn't come this far for nothing, so we waited outside for a chance to speak to him about those containers. At exactly two o'clock, Signor Tintore Blanc, who is a man of regular habits, came out for his lunch. 
At first, he told me he wasn't in Tory Blanc, so I said, why are you carrying his mail then? He said something in Spanish, which I couldn't quite catch. But he wouldn't be interviewed, and he was carrying his own anti-camera device, a small household hammer. What's the matter, Mr. Tory? Why are you getting so angry? What are you going to use that for? I'm a gotcha. Will you not talk to us, Mr. Tintori? It's perfectly reasonable that you should request. His volatile behavior, and of course that hammer, convinced us that he had something to hide. We soon found out what. Two days after they arrived in Barcelona, space researchers' 55 containers of shells were put on trucks and driven to the port's free zone. Of course, the usual reason for sending cargo to a free zone is because it's in transit. But to prove that space researchers' shells had not stayed in Spain, we needed to find a Spanish export permit. After many inquiries around the port, we were finally shown the document we were looking for. It had been made out by Tintore Blanc. Export Declaration 1869-78 showed that space researchers' 21,624 shells had stayed in the free zone till they were picked up by a ship. Julian Calvo, who works for Lloyd Shipping Agents, told us which ship those shells had gone on to. Do you know what happened to the shells after they were taken into the free zone, Senior Calvo? Yes, the last I know that was these uh, shells, they were shipped in a Dutch ship called Brisson. So they were exported out of Spain? Exported out of Spain, yes, definitely. The only thing left to check was where the Brisan went after she left Barcelona. Lloyd Shipping Intelligence tells us that she next docked in Durban, South Africa. There she unloaded general cargo, the nature of which her South African clients would not divulge. Yet space researchers' shells were supposed to have been taken into Spain and consigned to Barreras Hermanos. I have a hard time saying your name. Barreros. Uh... Barreros Hermanos. Yes, I guess that's the color, right. So the cargo was consigned to Barreros Hermanos, and it was for the Spanish military? It's Spanish military. There's an end-user certificate on it. But can you prove that the shells actually ended up with the uh, Spanish armed forces? Oh, no, the, the shells, the whole program is going lamentably slow. So where are these shell casings now? Well, I think Barreros is still struggling on the filling side of the proposition and uh are you I, sure they're in spain i know that that well i, I yeah uh, some of our people said they've, they've talked to them and seen them in spain and, and uh, i'm asking these questions about spain dr bull because our information is that the shells didn't stay in spain i can't comment i don't know whether they were or not according to what we've been told they were re-exported out of spain on a ship called the Brisan, does that ring a bell with you? No. We haven't got them back here yet. That's, well, as far as I know, uh, we have not got a contractual a contract from anybody to, to fill them. The, we have made a submission. The price. Brisan, apparently, left Barcelona on June the 27th, and it gave its destination as Canada, only guess what? Where did it go? South Africa. South Africa. Hmm. We, I, I haven't got it. We'll certainly check it. There may be more questions than Dr. Bull's checking can answer. If these weapons got to South Africa in this complicated way, how could it have happened without the knowledge of the government of Canada, which originally licensed the shipments? Without the knowledge of the government of Spain, which supplied one official document saying it had taken delivery of space research shells, and another saying the weapons had been exported. Without the knowledge of the government of Britain, which is responsible for Antigua. Here in the United States, the Defense Department, which has contracts with space research, says it knows nothing about space research's shells going to South Africa. But the Pentagon is supposed to watch defense contractors to make sure they obey the arms control laws. Should it have known? Should the Central Intelligence Agency have known? The CIA says, publicly at least, it knows nothing at all about the situation. 
the company that owns the prestigious international consulting firm Arthur D. Little once owned a majority of stock in space research and is still a major stockholder, but it too denies knowledge of shipments to South Africa. There will apparently now be a British government investigation. Space research, meanwhile, has come up with some changes in the story as told here. That Antigua port director who confirmed the two Gala land loadings, Emil Sweeney, has recanted in a letter to space researchers' lawyers. And one other change. Space researchers' attorneys told us last night that Gerald Bull is no longer president of space research. He's now just chief scientist. But this story remains more than one simply of shipments. It's a story of questions so far unanswered. They all relate to one bigger puzzle. How, in the face of an arms embargo of long standing, has South Africa been able to get an ample supply of the most modern Western weapons? For Public Television, I'm Christopher Lydon. If you see something wrong and you don't like what is really going on, look the person and remember the scorpion and say, it's joke you're making. Stay tuned now for the documentary, Birth of the Bomb, coming up next. This program has been a production of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and WGBH Boston. WGBH is solely responsible for its content. Tonight's program has been made possible by a grant from this and other public television stations. For a transcript, send $2 to World Special Event, South Africa. Box 1000, Boston, Massachusetts, 02118. <whistles>